Greetings, everyone. Well, here I am thinking that we were all done with the graphic novel collection, and as I was going through the comics, organizing them last night, I found a few more. I knew there was a few more hiding in there somewhere, just couldn't remember what they were. Well, anyway, essentially what we have here is uh, mostly a bunch of Batman ones, and a Babylon 5 one, and a, a, an independent comic uh, collection one. So let's call this Batman Babylon, today on the Multimedia Chronicles. Welcome back. Yeah, in uh, going through the collection here, I realized that uh, I, I think I kind of misestimated how many are actually here. Uh, specifically, I think I estimated a little low. Like, for example, I have the complete series of... Where is it here? Yeah, here we are. ROM, Space Knight, classic series. One of the earliest examples of... Uh, comic book based on a toy, actually. That was really good. But anyway, I had the complete series of it, alright? And the complete series, and I know they need to be in bags and backings. I'm short on bags and backings, unfortunately. Just whatever, okay? I'll, do with, I'll deal with that at some point. I'll keep the covers on, they stay out of the sun. Anyway, I had the complete run of ROM Space Knight. And that series ran for a total of 75 issues, and four annuals, and some crossovers. I have the whole thing. But here's the thing. Remember I said I forget how much these long boxes hold. I think it's about 200 or so, something like that. Yeah, well, ROM is like about 80 comics, and it only covers this much of a long box. Like, this... So this times, like, what, five, four, something like that? So what are we looking at, about three or 400 per box? Yeah, I haven't actually sat down and done a, uh, a full count yet. I just did a lot of organizing. So this is mostly comics based on toys, cartoons, and movie adaptations. This is all independent comics. I have a lot of stuff from independent publishers. I just love the independents. This is mostly Marvel's Epic Comics line from the 80s. Um, and a little bit of indies at the end. This is... the hell is this? Oh, wait a minute, this is all the toys. Well, what the hell's this, then? Oh, this is, like, science fiction and stuff. Yeah, so I got, like, Battlestar Galactica, Flash Gordon, things like that. And then, uh, this is just kind of a mishmash. Mostly my superhero stuff, comics from when I was a kid, and things like that. So there's quite a, quite a mix here. I mean, it still needs to be fully, properly organized, but, uh, it's getting there. It's definitely in better shape than it was when I started. I found a couple more while I was uh, doing the count there, so, yeah. Oh, Let's take a look at what we got here. Okay, so this is the leftovers from the graphic novel shelf. First off, we have, it's one of the ones I found, Serenity, Those Left Behind, which was the first of, sadly, very few comic books based in, in the uh, Serenity slash Firefly universe. Uh, this was originally published, I believe, as individual issues. One through three, yeah, this volume collects issues one through three of the Dark Horse comic book series Serenity, Those Left Behind. Um, I haven't actually read this one for a while. I bought it around the same time as uh, when I first saw the Serenity movie on DVD. Yeah, it, essentially, it, it more or less helps to bridge the gap between the series and the movie. So, yeah, not too bad, not too bad. I have not read any of the other Firefly comics. There's, uh, I think there's another little mini-series like this, and then they just put out one um, giving you some of the backstory of Shepard, so that's pretty cool. And then, of course, I have this one, which uh, was sent to me in a package not too long ago, Superman and Batman vs. Predator and Aliens. I have not read this one yet, but uh, I definitely will. I have read some of the other ones that were sent, though. I think it was, it was Morgan that sent me this one, along with uh, a whole bunch of other comics. Yeah, the artwork in this is really nice, i got to say. Like, it's all... Uh, beautiful painted artwork. Like a, a lot classier than you would think a sort of silly crossover event like this would be. But uh, well, that's pretty pretty snazzy indeed. 
And uh, where's a good picture of soups here? Oh, there we go. That's, that's kind of two-page splash there. Yeah, so that's pretty nice. Pretty nice indeed. All right, so then uh, getting into the ones that I found the other day, we have Babylon 5, The Price of Peace. Now, Babylon 5 didn't really have a lot of comics. This is actually a compilation of single issues that... Um, were published a while ago. There was a short-lived regular series that only ran for I think 11 issues, so like barely even a year. This particular graphic novel reprints issues 1 through 4 and 11. But the cool thing about the Babylon 5 comics is much like the novels that came out a while back, uh, these stories actually do fit quite comfortably into the continuity of the TV series. And for the most part they give you side stories about characters that are elsewhere than on the station. I mean, most of the events of the TV series center around events on the station. So this basically tells you the story of what happened to some of those, some of the characters who left the station um, afterwards, and it's pretty cool. So it's a nice, uh, nice companion piece to the show for sure. So if you, if you're a Babylon Five fan, you've never read these, I definitely recommend them. I mean, they're a pretty light read, and uh, you know, if we take a look here, where's some uh, some good examples? Yeah, like. I mean, the artwork in it, they, they definitely look a lot like their television counterparts, which is pretty cool. And uh, what else do we got here? Yeah, so we got like this cool story about uh, basically when uh, th this particular storyline follows Sinclair uh, shortly after he left Babylon 5. It kind of takes place parallel to the events of the end of season one and the beginning of season two of the TV series. So it basically talks about what happened to Sinclair when he uh, first went down to Minbar after leaving the station. So, some pretty cool stuff in there. And then the uh, the last story is actually about the origins of the psy -Corps. So you actually get to find out a lot of stuff about the psy -Corps, which is pretty cool. And, uh, and that's it. And I actually do have another Babylon 5 comic. It's not collected though, it's just a... Uh, uh, I can't remember where I put it. It's in here somewhere. <laughs> anyway, I'll show that some other time. Maybe we'll do a little thing about Babylon 5 stuff. But don't hold me to that. I may or I may or may not. Okay, so then we got some Batman graphic novels. I knew I had more Batman ones kicking around. Now this is a pretty notable one. This is probably one of the more famous stories to come out of the 80s. Batman, A Death in Family, which is the infamous story in which the Joker actually successfully manages to kill Robin. In this case, the Jason Todd Robin. Now this, I believe, is the first printing of the collected edition. Yes, it is, from 1988. So, first printing. With uh, these types of comics, you can usually tell what printing it is by the title of the story text. There's another one that's like that as well, which I actually have, and I'll show you in a moment. And then on the back, you actually have the covers of the original four issues. I remember when this came out, like when the original story came out, I actually did have the first two parts of the actual individual issues. And I remember the first two issues were actually double issues. So I think it was originally intended to be a six-part story, but they decided to truncate it down to four issues instead of six. Or they just wanted it to be a big event and decided to make the first two double issues. The last two were just regular size issues, I believe. Yeah, they were. You can tell by the prices on the cover. Yeah, the double issues were a dollar fifty U.S. or two dollars Canadian. The single issues, the single like regular size issues, were seventy-five cents U.S. or a dollar Canadian. So that gives you some idea. And then this collected edition, I mean, a collected edition like this would be about 15, 20 bucks now. It was only five bucks. <laughs> so, to be fair, it's not like the most spectacular collected edition. It's basically just the, uh, it's basically just the comics thrown together into a book. And the, the, uh, the type of paper used is uh, basically the same as the uh, original comics. Sorry, I'm just looking for a good screenshot here for you. Ah, there we go. There's the famous shot right there. Yeah, big warehouse explosion after the Joker beats Robin to a pulp with a crowbar. And uh, there's Batman taking his battered body out of the wreckage. Pretty intense stuff. I remember this made all the headlines when it originally happened. And then a couple years later, they killed Superman. So, yeah, this was just like the era of DC killing all its characters. It was, it was a good time had by all. And then... Uh, yeah, this is the other one I was talking about, which is kind of, you can tell what printing it is by the color of the text. This is actually the very first printing 
of Batman the Killing Joke, the famous Joker story written by Alan Moore and illustrated by famous British artist Brian Boland. Brian Boland at the time was most well known for Judge Dredd. He'd done a lot of Judge Dredd. And actually Alan Moore had done a lot of uh, 2000 AD and Judge Dredd stuff as well. I'll be very careful with this because this is a prized possession of mine. But uh, just to give you a little look at some of the artwork there, it's uh, very, very nice. Sadly, this isn't a terribly lengthy story, but it's definitely a, a powerful one and one that people tend to uh, remember. And it's... Uh, it, it's, it's particularly notable in that it's one of the stories where we really got to see the dark side of the Joker. Prior to this, he'd always been sort of, you know, the clown prince, as it were, the clown prince of crime. In this one, it really showed just how insane and flat-out sadistic and evil the Joker can be. And the phone's ringing. I'll be right back. It wasn't for me. Okay, so... Yeah, so anyway, this has been reprinted a number of times. If you look around uh, on eBay, I think, I think there's actually seven printings of just the regular edition, and each version has a different uh, color. Personally, I like the green the best because it goes, you know, with the Joker's hair being green. And then we have Catwoman, Her Sister's Keeper. Now, this one is kind of interesting because uh, it actually ties in pretty directly with Batman Year One which came out, uh, I don't know, about a year prior to it. But this is essentially, uh, as far as I know, the first time we ever got a real proper origin story for Catwoman. I mean, her origins had always been kind of mysterious, and I don't know that they'd really been gone into very much in the comics, at least not to my recollection. So this one actually uh, gives us a proper origin. And it's a pretty nasty origin. I mean, she, Selina Kyle has had one crappy life, and... Uh, you know, it's really interesting to see the the sequence of events that uh, lead up to her becoming Catwoman. Essentially, she's a prostitute in this, originally, and, and one of the main villains in this story is a really nasty-ass pimp who's uh, causing trouble for her sister. And her sister is actually a nun. So you have a nun with a prostitute sister. Just through, basically, just the hell of her life, she ends up becoming Catwoman and uh, getting back at the pimp and such. So yeah, it's it's quite a you know quite a dark story. Definitely not going to be everybody's cup of tea. I would not say necessarily one for the kiddies because there is some uh, you know there's not like a really, really like excessive sex and violence. It's just more the subject matter is uh, is a little bit on the mature side. So uh, yeah, so be warned about that. So it's pretty cool stuff. And Batman Year One. I actually used to have the original issues of it, but now I just have it in the collected edition that I showed in the first graphic novel thing, the uh, complete Frank Miller Batman, which actually now is not complete because, of course, he's done some more Batman since. But this includes Batman Year One, Wanted, San Santa Claus, Dead or Alive, and, of course, The Dark Knight Returns. But it's interesting. I say it ties in directly because there's actually scenes from Batman Year One that are paralleled in Catwoman, Her Sister's Keeper. And you kind of see it from both sides. You see it from Batman's side in this version, and then you see it from Selina Kyle's side in the other version. And there's even some panels that are exactly the same between the two. So, But then it, it goes off in different directions, depending which story you're reading. So it's pretty cool the way they tied it all together. I like that. And then finally, for the Batman stuff, no Batman collection is complete without the comic book adaptation of the 1989 movie. Now this is a beautiful uh, prestige edition, as they called it, square bound. And I was always really impressed with the artwork in this because it really captures the look of the actors from the movie. I mean, a lot of comic book adaptations wouldn't do terribly well. I mean, like, just look there, that shot of him, of Bruce Wayne taking his glasses off. I mean, that's Michael Keaton right there. I mean, come on. Looks just like him. I mean, it's beautiful. Let's see if I can get a good Batman shot here for you. Well, and then we got the Joker, of course, which is great. Looks just like Jack. And there, you know, you got like the some of the fight in the cathedral at the end and stuff like that. But uh, I mean, if you just look at the the paintings of the cover, I mean, it's just just a beautiful, beautiful adaptation. And uh, if you're a fan of this this uh, particular movie version of Batman, like I am. Uh, it's invaluable. There was actually a couple of different editions of this that came out. There was one that was just done sort of as an oversized comic. It didn't have the painted cover. 
and it wasn't in the uh, prestige format. Uh, this is by far the nicer edition because it's actually on the glossy uh, prestige paper, which is quite nice. And the other one was just on a regular paper. Now, Batman Returns did not apparently get the prestige format, at least not to my knowledge. So this is actually much closer to how the alternate version of the Batman, the uh, first Batman movie adaptation was. And this is, um, again, you know, really nice artwork in this. Let me see if I can find a couple shots here for you. Yeah, there we go. So we got, like, uh, Bruce Wayne there and Catwoman there and uh, looking pretty good. I think, actually, I think the artwork in the first one's a little bit better, but, uh, you know, overall, I think they did a pretty nice job on this one. Yeah, so there you go. Of course, not I guess not having a lot of pages to adapt the uh, entire movie, you'll notice some of the pages are really crammed with panels to try to capture all the action. In the uh, the first one, I noticed they seemed to do it uh, went a little bit more for the spectacle rather than uh, trying to cram as much of the script into it as possible. But you know, overall, I think it's a pretty good adaptation. But uh, of the two, the first one's definitely my favorite. As far as the two movies go, eh, it's hard to say. I lean towards the first one, but I really like the just dark twistedness of the second one as well. And then finally we have an independent comic favorite of mine, MICRA, which stands for Mind Controlled Remote Automaton. Now, you'll see some web pages out there that describe the that, uh, including a comic book database that listed as Mind Controlled Repo Remote Automation. It's not automation, it's automaton. So it's basically about a woman who is paralyzed through a horrible accident and is given a new lease on life by participating in this experiment where she can actually have her mind projected into this virtually indestructible and incredibly powerful, and not to mention sexy as hell, robot body. It's fantastic. It's just, it's a beautiful black and white, you know, beautiful black and white independent comic. The thing that really got me about this when I first read it was I just really fell in love with the characters and the story. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a futuristic world where things are going wrong. And uh, Micra, the, the robot here, is, is kind of an instrument for humanity's salvation in a way. So part of it is, you know, the main character is wanting to do the right thing, but also because Micra is so powerful, needless to say, some people with less than noble intentions want to get their hands on her. Yeah, it's some pretty cool stuff, and uh, I believe it was originally planned to be a 12-issue series. I do have most of the uh, individual issues as well. Yeah, this one I know exactly where it is. So, you know, we got the first issue and uh, and the rest. So they, they were planning to do uh, 12 issues, as far as I know. It was going to be a limited series. But for whatever reason, they only got as far as uh, issue number seven, which ends on a killer cliffhanger, by the way, and then never finished it. You know, I've always been disappointed by that. I have no idea what happened. I did a bit of poking around the internet to see what happened and if there was any plans to continue it in any form, and found out that the, uh, the guy who wrote it um, was no longer doing comics and had instead devoted the past 20 years of his life to J JFK conspiracy theories. What the hell happened? <laughs> so, yeah, dude, get back to writing comic books, okay? Take off the tinfoil hat. Anyway, alright, so that definitely covers the rest of the graphic novel collection and gives you a total count of my individual comics collection. So I guess next time with the comic book videos, whenever that is, I'm not sure how often I'm going to do these, but I wanted to get at least some of the overview ones done with. Yeah, so next time we'll, we'll start diving into some of my favorite series that, uh, you know, I've collected over the years and talk about those a little bit. All right. So until then, uh, I guess that's it. I guess that's it for now. I'm actually going to pack these up and put them back in the bedroom because I don't want to have them taking over the living room. Even though it is nice having access to, like, ready access. I've actually been rereading some of my old favorites over the past couple days. It's great. I love to bring them out every once in a while and just kind of leaf through them and, and reread some old favorites and, you know, and just kind of enjoy them all over again. I really enjoy uh, rediscovering my collection like that. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in there and, uh, and well, I'll tell you a lot about them in uh, coming videos. I think, uh, I think you'll find it interesting because I don't tend to go for a lot of the sort of typical stuff that most collectors do. Like, you won't find a lot of superhero stuff in my collection. You won't find a lot of, 
you know, necessarily commercially successful stuff. I mean, I've got a lot of independence, I've got a lot of fantasy and sci-fi. i got some stuff that was popular back in the day, but has since been kind of forgotten. So, yeah, I think it'll be an interesting journey going through Zarin Isaac's comic collection. Alrighty. Until then, that's it from me to you for now. So until next time, sayonara. And thanks for watching. And sayonara. Because it's about a uh, paralyzed girl who gets new life and new motion um, basically by transferring, by projecting her mind into, the, uh, into a synthetic uh, 